Good morning, everyone, and I'd like to welcome you to the Sabbath School class today. This is from the Alvarado Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, online Sabbath School class, and we're beginning a, the first lesson of the uh, last quarter in 2020. It's on education. So before we begin, let's just pray and ask the Lord's blessing on our study this morning. Lord, thank you so much for your goodness and your love toward us. Lord, thank you for redeeming us, making us your children. And Lord, thank you that we can study this lesson. It reminds us of what it is that you've redeemed us and what you want to restore back into us. Bless our study now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so this quarter we're going to be talking about education. And uh, as far as as far as education goes, I mean, we, we're always learning. Um, in fact, they say that even before we are born, we're learning, uh, learning our parents' voices, learning um, uh, all kinds of responses to chemical stimuli. And so uh, all our lives, basically, you could say we are in the process of learning. And education is... Uh, is such a such an important thing because if we learn things correctly then we're able to uh, know know things correctly and to be able to interact in our world much more successfully and have a desired outcome all right but this first lesson it begins it starts in the beginning as most good stories do and uh, starts with the very first humans on planet Earth, beginning with the education in the Garden of Eden. So let's go ahead and uh, read the, the text that goes along with this lesson. They call it the memory text, and if you've memorized it, blessings on you. It says in Job chapter 36, verse 22, Behold, God is exalted by his power. Who teaches like him? Well, I don't know. I suppose God is the best at everything, right? <laughs> so God is the best teacher. And um, that is something that, that, that we as humans tend to uh, struggle with just a little bit, don't we? We like to think that we have figured things out. And when God says something, if it doesn't match exactly with what we think, we're so quick to say, yeah, but, right? <laughs> Yeah, but we need to say more, yes, Lord. So, um, in the Garden of Eden, God, or at the beginning, God placed our first parents of the human race in a fabulous garden, just absolutely beautiful. He designed it just for them. And as they, um, as they're there in their, their perfection and brand new beauty that God had created, and when he finished creating, he said, um, and he and he finished all that he had done, and it was good. So everything he did was good. Um, Ellen White talks a little bit about the education in the Garden of Eden. In education, in the book Education, page 20. The system of education instituted at the beginning of the world was to be a model for man throughout all lifetime. As an illustration of its principles, a model school was established in Eden, the home of our first parents. The Garden of Eden was the schoolroom, Nature was the lesson book, the creator himself was the instructor, and the parents of the human family were the students. Who teaches like him? I wish I had an experience of the Garden of Eden so I could more accurately describe what was going on there. Um, but if you think about it, it, it almost seems like as if the education that was in the Garden of Eden was a lot more enjoyable than classroom study. <laughs> you know what I mean? I spent a lot of time in a classroom. I taught for 13 years at Oklahoma Academy, and uh, I've spent a sheer amount of time in the classroom. And, um, oh, you know, the, the discipline that you can learn in a classroom is, is really good. Uh, the subject material that gives you the skills to be able to process different pieces of information, understand the world around you, um, communicate better with others, have context in why we're communicating a certain way with others. You know, there's just so much, so much wonderful things that we can learn in the classroom setting. 
but it is it really as enjoyable <laughs> as the Garden of Eden was? I mean, think about it. You get to run around, romp around with the animals, play with the animals and, and whatnot. Oh, man, that would have been so much fun. Uh, maybe that's why people work at zoos. Maybe they're like, hey, this is just this is what we were designed for, was to work with animals and play with animals. Um, so the first school, uh, you know, it, it was, it was there in a very, very natural setting. It, you can't get more natural than that. It was, it was completely unartificial. No, no metal desks, no old industrial carpeting, no whiteboards, right? Um, so, uh, in Genesis, Genesis 2 verses 7 through 23, let's notice, um, what God's purposefulness was in creating, placing, and employing Adam. And uh, so we're just going to read through this. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Oh, wow. So... Cherries, mangoes, papayas, apples. Well, you know, there's there's some some trees that I suppose through good uh, genetic uh, mixing and um, hybridization uh, we've created that may not have been in the or we've we've designed that may not have been in the Garden of Eden. So I don't I don't want to make presumptions on on exactly what all was there, but it it was just amazing stuff. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of the midst of the garden, and the tree of the um, and went out of the. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, and a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. This is an amazing thing. I, I don't want to take a lot of time here, but think about this: the rivers that we have today, they take all these little uh, rills, they they join together to make streams. The streams join together. To, to make creeks, the creeks join together to make rivers, the rivers join together to make mega rivers, and they head off to the ocean. This says that there was a river that flowed from the garden, and from there it parted into four rivers. Uh, the first was Pison, and that is which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. Just in case you were wondering where the gold is, it's not in Havilah anymore. Um, interesting study. If you look uh, in Ellen White, she actually says where all the gold is now. Um, and the gold of the land is good. There is delium and the onyx stone. So think about this. Um, the this is before the flood. So you know whatever whatever geological formations we're seeing here aren't aren't obvious today because. The, the way the earth works now after the deluge is very different. And there's Delium and the Onyx Stone. And the name of the second river, so the first one was Pison. The second river is Gihon, the same as it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. 14, this is verse 14. And the name of the third river, Hedekel, and that is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. So there are four rivers and we have rivers today that are named it's these similar names, but they clearly don't do what um, what this just described. But it's absolutely amazing. So you have a Garden of Eden. There's a river that flows out of the garden, and out of this river forms four rivers, major rivers that apparently went across the face of the earth. So just an amazing setup. So... Just such wonderfulness, right? I mean, check this out, the language. Every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. I mean, it's just a really, really awesome place. You don't have to bring your own snacks when you go to the Garden of Eden, okay? <laughs> the snacks are provided. They grow on the trees. Um, verse, uh, verse 15, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And the Lord said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him an help meet. And out of the ground 
The Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and the fowls of the air and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord had taken from the man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So how amazing is that, right? So we have this extremely beautiful setting. We have a garden that was created and designed just for man. And, uh, and, and there we have um, a, uh, we have, so we have plants, we have animals. There's, um, it's surrounded apparently, this garden is surrounded by awesomeness. Um, it says that there was gold and gems and everything all around there. Um, and then, and then there's the animals and God, um, knowing that man needed a, an express, a way to express himself and produce himself through the expression of love. He brought also a woman. He didn't bring a woman because otherwise Adam would be bummed out. Adam was made perfect. He didn't have to be bummed out. But when love has a way to express itself more fully, then we can enjoy what God has designed us to be more fully. All right. Um, so there's a lot of, a lot of wonderful, wonderful lessons that we can learn from, from the perfection and beauty. But the story doesn't stop there. It speaks of an intrusion. An intrusion of, of sorrow, an introduction of sorrow that did not have to be. But God was not caught off guard. He had made provision should such an emergency occur. So we, in Genesis chapter 2 and 3, we see a shift from absolute beauty, perfection, and goodness to tones of the word subtle shows up for the first time. Let's, let's look at those verses. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Ah, oh, man. I mean, Eve was tricked. She was. You know, and in the Bible over and over again, and Jesus himself and the apostles in the New Testament over and over again, they keep emphasizing, be not deceived. Be not deceived. Beware of false prophets. Beware of false Christ. Be not deceived. This, this creature, this beast, this power goes out to deceive the whole world. Right? So we're just warned again and again, don't be deceived. So we can, we can say, hey, you know, they were deceived. Maybe you know, they were tricked into it. Maybe they don't have any fault. Well, it, it's, it's not so much of pointing to see who to blame because Adam and Eve were quick to point to blame as soon as God confronted them on the errors of their ways. The biggest, the biggest thing to know is God has taken upon himself the responsibility. Check this out. He took upon himself the responsibility to fix the problem. Okay? We must, we must learn how to Listen to God's word, 
say yes when he speaks instead of using using our human intellect to try to rationalize or 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 make of none effect what God has plainly said. If God plainly says something, then we should be saying yes, Lord, to that. Otherwise, when a deception comes along, um, like the serpent who said, Eve, check it out, I'm touching the tree and I'm not dead, you know, using reasoning. And besides, I mean, think about this. The serpent said, well, God knows that when you, when you eat this, you'll be like him. He had already made Adam and Eve in, their, in his image, right? I mean, that, that had already happened. She already was like God. And so it, it was, when you follow the reasoning of the deceiver, and you go along with the reasoning of the deceiver, you're going to get in trouble. It's going to conflict. It's going to contradict the plain truth of God and his word. And, um, and so we, we don't need to be deceived. So meanwhile, so Eve, Eve is being deceived. Meanwhile, Adam wanders into a difficult situation himself. Ellen White um, elaborates on this in Patriarchs and Prophets. She says, Adam understood that his companion had transgressed the command of God, disregarded the only prohibition laid upon them as a test of their fidelity and love. It was a terrible struggle in his mind. He mourned that he had permitted Eve to wander from his side, but now the deed was done. He must be separated from her whose society had been his joy. How could he have it thus? Right? How could he have it thus? Again, it goes back to our human reasoning. Why are we so quick to our human reasoning? Because we really don't trust God the way we should. So... There was, there was loss. There was, there was definite loss. Um, Adam and Eve were no longer able to eat of the tree of life, which meant that eventually they would die. That's, that is the result of not having access to the tree of life when you are a mortal being, apparently. And uh, aside from sin and wickedness, where there's murder and, and, and death and sickness and disease... So, what, what, how, do we, how do we recover from this? Is there, is there any hope or is it just lost? Well, thankfully, God immediately, as soon as this problem came, he came down and he started educating them about what to do now. He said, look, you've sinned. You're going to die. Your spirit, you've separated from me spiritually. Spiritually, you have died. But now, but you'll also physically die. And this is what's going to end up happening. There's going to come a time in which the serpent is going to be defeated by a coming redeemer. And so awesome, it's so awesome that God stepped in and took that position because otherwise we were, there's no way we could have done anything on our own. Like, like what the quote said, the deed was done. You cannot undo something that has been done. Only on a computer is control Z, okay? If you, yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's, if there's flowers in the front yard, grandma says, do not pick the flowers. And you go out there and you're playing and you're like, oh, that one's pretty. And you pick it. You can't put it back. I can attest to this because I've tried to, right? It's like, oh, you, pick, you weren't supposed to pick the flower. Oh, let's put it back. <laughs> that doesn't work. You can't put the flower back. The deed was done. All right, so regaining what was lost. In light of all that was lost when human beings left the garden, these verses in 2 Peter that we're going to read um, come as an encouragement that much can be of what, uh, of what can be regained. What does Peter write when, um, that we must do in order to seek restoration to God's image? All right, um, this is 2 Peter chapter... 1, verses 3 through 11. All right. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, 
that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, he cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten what he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Boy, look at that list. That is amazing, right? So Christ has, through his divine power, he's given everything that we need to achieve godliness. And, and he goes through this list. We, we often call it Peter's ladder. Add to your faith virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temperance, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity. And notice the promise here. It says, if these things be in you and abound, you're going to just be, it's, it's, it's an amazing life. I mean, think about this. Is it a better life to have love and kindness and godliness and patience? Or would you rather be irritated, impatient, uh, hurt, pain, hurting people? I mean, the, the life that Christ offers us is absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Think about Think about how Adam and Eve treated each other as soon as God called them out on doing something wrong. Immediately, Adam's throwing Eve under the bus. There weren't even buses around back then, but Adam, Adam invented the bus and threw her under it. So just look at these verses. Look how amazing this is. I mean, it says, add to your faith virtue, ver knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness. These are so much better. I mean, they're, they're way better than being impatient, uh, having resentment, um, bitterness, hostility, um, selfishness, uh, uh, indulging in, in appetite. So you just feel sick afterward. You feel bad. Ignorance. Uh, it just... The opposite of these, you just think, okay, well, yeah, that's, that's kind of where people kind of live. But God says, no, I want you to live in something so much better. Okay. So where do people tend to live? In their mind, right? The psalmist says, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Where do, where do a lot of other people live? Where does the world live? Second Peter chapter 2, verses... Um, uh, 1 through 17. We're just going to read through this. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring up upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah and the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly." And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, and condemned them with an overthrow, making them an sample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelt, dwelling among them, and seeing and hearing, it vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Despise government. There might be some of that going on right now. Uh, presumptuous they are, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities, whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusations against them before the Lord. 
But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of these things which that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in this daytime. Spots they are, and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, in heart they have dis exercised with covetous practice, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Basor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Oh, have mercy, Lord, don't let me be a lover of, un- of the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. I'll have mercy. So, not receiving the education that the Lord desired to give people, we see a tremendous degradation that has taken place. This degradation that Paul was talking about there, it's no different today. Our society isn't just dramatically better, right? Um, Yeah, we have more stuff. We have more fancy stuff, but... You know, people in general, yeah, yeah. There's there's people like that. The education of Christ brings us out of that back into that original image that He's preserved for us. Something that He longs to do. Um, let's um, let us continually seek God. His education, his will, and his way is so much better than anything that we can come up with. And Christ wants to teach us these sweet lessons that we read it from Peter of, of faith, virtue, temperance, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, charity. Brother, oh, I tell you what, just what Christ has for us, what the sweet lessons he wants us to learn are so much better than anything, anything that the world has to offer. I want to... Friday has an amazing quote from Patriarchs and Prophets, and I'd just like to read through and close with that before, we're, um, before we pray to close our lesson study. The holy pair were not only children under the fatherly care of God, but students receiving instruction from the all-wise creator. Can you imagine actually just every day being able to meet with your creator and learn from him? Oh, wait, we, we can do that. They were visited by angels and were granted communion with their maker with no obscuring veil between. Ah, there's the difference. We do have an obscuring veil between. They were full of the vigor imparted by the tree of life. Their intellectual power was but little less than that of the angels. The mysteries of the visible universe, the wondrous works of him which is perfect in knowledge, afforded them an exhaustless source of instruction and delight. The laws and operations of nature, which have engaged men's study for 6,000 years, were opened to their mind by the infinite framer and upholder of all. They held converse with leaf and flower and tree. So if you see someone talking to leaves, flowers, and trees, they're not crazy. Well, they might be crazy, but but it's okay to do that. Uh, Gathering from each the secrets of its life with every living creature from the mighty Leviathan that playeth among the waters to the insect moat that floats in the sunbeam, Adam was familiar. He had given to each its name, and he was acquainted with the nature and habits of all, God's glory in the heavens, the innumerable worlds in their orderly revolutions, the balancing of the clouds, the mysteries of light and sound, of day and night. All were open to the study of our first parents. On every leaf of the forest or stone of the mountains, in every shining star, in earth and air and sky, God's name was written. The order and harmony of creation spoke to them of infinite wisdom and power. They were ever discovering some attraction that filled their hearts with deeper love and called forth fresh expressions of gratitude. Our friends, that's exactly where God wants us to be. And he's made it possible for us to be there in that position in which we see our creator around us and that we're able to have fellowship with our creator. We're able to understand things more and more. 
I, I wish, I wish I had that quote pulled up because I, I just, it just came to my mind and, and I want to share it with you. Those who are surrendered to Christ, and I'm, I'm misquoting this badly, those who are surrendered to Christ, those who are Christ and, and, and continually seek the heart of Christ, there's no natural mystery that cannot be revealed to them. It's amazing how that as we get closer to the Creator, the mysteries of the universe seem simpler. They're, they're not so complex anymore. So, the true education, the education that God wants to give us, may look different than our classical classroom, desk, chalkboard, instructor with a desk. It may look different than that. But however God is teaching you, I pray that our eyes will be open, that as God continues to teach me, that my eyes will be open, and that I will be humble enough that even if the instruction comes in a way that I'm not used to or, or expecting, and maybe at first I don't recognize it, that I will be a student in the school of Christ. Let us pray. Lord, thank you so much that you invite us to come back to the original design. Lord, you want fellowship with your creatures. You long to be with us. Lord, it's us that have rejected you. Forgive us of that. Lord, soften our hearts. Come into our hearts today. Live in us, dwell in us, make us your habitation. Teach us your ways, O Lord. Thank you. Amen.